Okay, I just got another microphone, so I hope the sound quality will be a bit better now. Okay. Yeah, otherwise you can maybe turn off your video and maybe that will help with the connection. Um, so I was sent some questions today by Sandra for uh, um, I'll post them in the chat so everybody can read them uh oh yeah I see we lost Zigurds um, Yeah, there are some connection problems. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, maybe Natalia, you can turn off your video, so that the, because it seems to be having some problems with the. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. So the first question, I'll just repeat, is that from the magical point of view, what does addiction look like? If a magically stable person's energy's body, uh, energy body is supposed uh, to be so stable as to have no holes through which the energy goes away, uh, then it would mean that this person is not an addict. However, how does love work? Is a magically stable person capable of loving? Can a person be an addict and self-sufficient at the same time? So it's a quite an interesting topic. Um, unfortunately, there is not a very, uh, there's not just one answer to this, uh, to this question. Um, if you look at uh, drugs or um, uh, things which really alter a person's consciousness, uh, there are roughly three types of drug which um, can be taken and some drugs have several effects in several categories. Um, so the first uh, uh, type of drug is basically um, a relaxant uh, drug. So things like um, heroin, like alcohol, um, they relax a person, they untense, they unwind. Um, also marijuana does that to a certain degree. And a person goes into a more uh, relaxed state, also a more meditative state, a more receptive state in which often the very busy, stressed out thinking mind becomes relaxed and then often the deeper layers of the, uh, of the psyche, uh, the subconscious, the old memories, the associations can, uh, can move up a bit. So this type of drug is usually um, very uh, addictive uh, because people are in a way uh, looking for that side of themselves which is relaxed, which is at peace but due to circumstances in their lives they cannot find it because maybe they're poor or they're stressed at work or 
having lots of fights, so it is often also an escapist drug. Uh, people use it to escape their own lives, uh, their own reality, their own minds, their own uh, feelings. So they, it's often a method to get away from everything, including yourself. And uh, this type of drug is highly addictive. Um, the second type of drug is the stimulant drug, which has, in a way, an opposite effect. Um, if you look at it from a spiritual point of view, it, you could say that the relaxant drug often helps a person from a spiritual point of view to reach their subconsciousness, their deeper layers, while the stimulant drugs usually don't. Um, there are drugs like um, uh, amphetamine, um, uh, cocaine, speed, um, these types of drugs usually um, amplify the person's energy, while the uh, relaxant drugs, they usually reduce a person's energy. Um, often these activating drugs, they also lead to more, um, uh, yeah, to being more uh, in a heightened state of awareness, which basically means often that the ego is stronger or more in control or more focused. Um, so it often creates a narrowing, a focusing, where there's actually less uh, association, uh, less deep thought, less consideration. Um, the third type of drugs are the psychedelic drugs. Um, so they are the drugs which really alter a person's uh, perception of reality. They allow people to hallucinate or to have yeah, associations. Um, from the uh, uh, spiritual perspective, uh, depressant drugs are generally um, not very healthy. Um, because the, uh, in a way the, the outer shell of our energy body, which is the ego, and which are our thoughts, they become more quiet, more peaceful. So in a way, our outer layer becomes dormant, but it's often also in our outer layer where we have our defenses. So people become more easily influenced, they are more open, and depending on what energy is around them, they get influenced in a positive way or in a negative way. Uh, but they are more vulnerable to spirits, to curses, to just any environment or being in there uh, which is around them. Um, so this damage does uh, repair itself over time, uh, but over time can be quite long. Um, also, there are um, various abnormalities of the brain uh, which cause similar effects, which also cause weaknesses in the, in the outer layer of the aura, in the mental layer, in the consciousness layer, um, so that the people can very easily be influenced or taken over by other entities. So even though it can help, um, it is not the, yeah, the drug of choice for spiritual development. Uh, it is good for um, exploring yourself, exploring your own inner world, um, and to to get rid of your programming um, so you can really separate the original you from the, yeah, in a way, the learned, conditioned you. Um, second type of uh, drugs, the stimulant drugs, um, they can be quite helpful depending on what part of the energy body they, uh, they strengthen. Um, but in general they um, limit the amount of contact you have with your environment. So they tend to turn people into more aggressive people, less moral people, um, more selfish people. Um, because the person becomes more focused on their own power, on their own thoughts, on their own goals, and they become less sensitive, less loving. Um, so you find that after a few years of using like speed or cocaine uh, that the personality changes uh, into yeah, more of a uh, goal-oriented person rather than a people-oriented person. Um, the psychedelic drugs are actually the least addictive of all the, the three groups of drugs. 
you find that uh, psychedelic drugs are often used um, in a, a recreative fashion or in a spiritual fashion. Um, okay, there's. I'll try to get Sandra back. Just a moment. Uh, okay. Um, right. So I. Uh, now uh, you find that actually both the stimulant and the depressant drugs they uh, bring a person to a state they get very addicted to, they get used to, they feel better about themselves if they're using alcohol or they feel better about themselves if they're using speed um, depending on whether they want to get away from their ego part or they want to get more into and stay into their ego part uh, so either they are attracted to their own subconscious layers or they're atta attached to their own conscious layers or repulsed by the other one. Uh, you find actually with uh, the um, hallucinogenic drugs that they're not very addictive at all. Uh, usually people take them once a month um, and that is because the hallucinogenic drugs uh, they don't help you to get away from things rather they bring you to certain aspects of yourself and this also means that these uh, hallucinogenic drugs can give you very good trips or very bad trips depending on what part of yourself you're going to. Uh, hallucinogenic drugs by their effect they also unbalance you uh, so they also increase your vulnerability to attacks to spirits and to other things. So there's definitely risks involved. Um, from the shamanic perspective, um, a plant or an animal uh, is a teacher. Um, so if you take, for instance, uh, ayahuasca or peyote or uh, Santa Maria, um, they're not meant to be used as a drug or as a recreational tool. They're meant as a teacher to teach you about yourself, to teach you about the universe, to teach you about how to travel. And uh, in general, um, in the Cherokee tradition in which I've been taught, uh, they say that you should use everything four times. If by that time you haven't learned anything, then you're not going to learn anything. So um, try any drug four times, see if it has uh, an effect which you can then copy or which you can hold on to uh, as a benefit and if not then trying to use the same drug again is, uh, is a dependency and it is therefore an addiction because uh, if you're not meant to have a power you should not try to get it artificially either uh, and this is one of the problems of how yeah, like European and North American people uh, work with some of the shamanic drugs um, so yeah, uh, you can definitely see if a person uh, is a drug user from their energy body. Um, the problem is that it is hard to see how recent it has been. Um, often if people use marijuana, you get holes in the aura and they stay for a few months. If people use cocaine, usually the aura gets more spiky and that effect tends to take a few years to, uh, to reside. Uh, it also depends what, peop what other exercises people are doing to enhance their energy body. Are they doing reconsideration? Are they doing tensegrity? Are they doing yoga? Uh, are they doing martial arts? Uh, so uh, I also know people who practice, for instance, martial arts but also use drugs. And it's actually a very good compensation um, to, in a way, enhance the energy body so that it can deal with the drug or you can compensate the and this balance which is generated by the drug. Uh, also people can get more used to it so that their energy body doesn't become unbalanced by the drug anymore. So it's also kind of a uh, habit, yeah, just building up a habit or a tolerance for the drug, both physically and energetically. Um, so about losing energy 
um, this is a more of a, of a tricky thing um, because there are many ways to, to contact. You can travel to other worlds in a magical fashion or you can travel to worlds in a mystical or kabbalistical or even hierophantical fashion. Um, if you're a magical traveler, you indeed need all your energy. And to travel to other worlds in a magical method uh, requires that you start transmuting your own energy by use of your willpower. And if you transform your energy into the energy which is more similar to that of another layer of consciousness, then like a magnet your energy body will be attracted to that layer of consciousness. And this way a magician can move uh, their consciousness to higher or to lower layers. And um, the magician is limited of course by the uh, uh, skill he has or she has in controlling their energy body and also the energy patterns with energy vibrations they know and their skill at uh, emulating them. Um, so for a magical traveler they c yeah, any hole uh, would uh, destabilize them and they cannot travel as well because yeah, all kinds of influences would pollute their energy and would thereby yeah, also cause them to vibrate between their intended destination and the other places where the yeah, polluting energies come in from. Um, so uh, from a magical point of view actually drugs are not helping uh, because drugs in general limit your amount of control, they have other energies. Um, so as a magical traveler drugs are not that useful. It is quite different if you have a uh, mystical traveler. So the mystical traveler uh, opens up their energy body to the layer of consciousness or the being they want to get in touch with. And they allow the other being to in a way um, or the other layer of consciousness to flow into their own energy body. So their own energy body is just in a way absorbing and reacting, responding to the energy it is feeling and it is adapting to it. Um, so for instance, if I put an icon in front of me and I pray to the saint, I open my energy body to the energy of that saint and the energy which is coming off of the icon is kind of like um, a seed uh, which causes the rest of my energy also to be um, transformed into a similar vibration. So in a way I'm planting an energy inside myself and allowing my mystical energy to respond to it to become the same. And this way you can make contact with saints, gods, goddesses, but you need at least a seed, some way to attune to, uh, yeah, to that energy. And this can also be a mantra or uh, a mandala or uh, some other symbol. Um, if you are using the mystical method, then often uh, drugs can be quite useful, especially the relaxant drugs, because they allow you to push away your surface thoughts, your ego, and all your defense mechanisms, which are yeah, in a way keeping you from transmuting, keeping you from transforming. They're keeping you in a way focused on this world. And if you go into a more dreamlike, relaxed state, it is easier to travel. Um, hallucinogenic drugs also help in this, uh, uh, in this method because they also destabilize the energy body so it can respond more strongly to the seeds you're receiving. Um, for the Kabbalistic traveler, um, it's, drugs can be useful but they have to be used in ritual so you can't just apply the drug to yourself um, because as a Kabbalistic uh, traveler you want to use your knowledge, your symbols um, to create a very specific energetic mix. So anything you eat, you smoke, um, you drink uh, needs to have exactly the right energy so it will have the yeah, desired effect on you. So and um, Often the, any uh, substance, whether it is animal or um, plant-like, can alter its vibration depending on how it is prepared or how it is talked to or 
written upon with symbols or um, so in working with uh, the Kabbalistic traveling method um, drugs can be useful if you use the proper ritual for them so in by using the proper ritual you tell the drug exactly what you want from it you want to have a healing journey or you want to go to the your own subconscious or you want to talk to a higher being or maybe to an ancestor and uh, if in a way the, the animal or the plant knows what you're intending to do you have a healthy relationship with it it can transmute its energy with your help or often it requires some sacrifice to liberate the energy for the transmutation and once this energy is transmuted it can also transmute you so first you do a ritual to transmute the, the drug and then you do a ritual to allow the drug to transmute you so in a way you're programming the drug to program you um, so this is uh, theoretically it can also be done with um, uh, chemical drugs because they also have one spe very specific effect um, and there are people who experiment with it I don't know exactly how successful they are um, but well since they keep on doing it they must be having at least fun um, so that brings us to the last method of um, um, of traveling and that's the hierophantical method um, the hierophantical method is um, in a way kind of a mix of, of all the other methods but the big difference is that it really um, depends a lot on harmony or quality of relationship um, well any of the other things can be done like the, the, yeah, the magical tra traveling can be done through willpower mystical through humility to surrender uh, Kabbalistical just through knowledge knowing the right rit rituals the right symbols and their effects um, in um, if you want to work on a hyperphantic method it is really about making the other place your home or your second home it is not just you're visiting there or shooting yourself into that dimension or that state of consciousness um, you're really trying to build up a life there um, so this is also why dreaming is so important if you want to work in a hyperphantical manner because your dream body can also go to the same level and meet with the same people and you can build up an astral life there and this is very much what the hierophantical method is about it is about connecting the life of your spirit which is happening uh, while your spirit is something is out of your body it has its own life and trying to link the life of your spirit back to the life of your incarnated self and to try to harmonize the two um, so that your incarnated life becomes a reflection of your activities as a spirit often the other types of uh, trips they are often more in, in service of the incarnated self because it is need something from another world um, rather than it is a complete surrender to, uh, to the spiritual, uh, spiritual side of yourself um, so about addiction um, addiction is, is, a, is a risk for pretty much anybody ex but least so for the magical person uh, for a magical person they require control over their own energy bodies that means they are controlling themselves and not something else is controlling them so I don't think magical persons would easily go towards using um, drugs anyway and if they do it it's only as a teacher or as a yeah as a support until they can do it themselves I think for other types of yeah uh, spiritual practices addiction can be a, a greater risk um, ultimately it is about uh, responsibility um, if a person takes complete responsibility over their feeling and they recognize their ability to make themselves feel good or bad and their uh, skill at uh, that any feeling how you feel if you're happy or not is a choice 
which you are able to make as a spirit and as an incarnated being, uh, then you don't need other things to make that choice for you. It is often when a person feels they have no power, they have no control, um, that they are looking for a savior or a helper outside of themselves and when they don't accept their responsibility for their own lives then they're very open to addiction. Um, ah, and then indeed about how love works. Well, yes, it does work very different for a magical person. Uh, or Love is very much, uh, well, there's actually several things you can be talking about if you're talking about love. Hmm. But love itself is quite a big topic. Um, so one of the things which is uh, essential, at least for any relationship, uh, is the ability to connect energetically. And um, this connection can be receptive or penetrating or it can be more uh, more equal but without an exchange of energy there is no relation um, so a magically active person uh, tends to be very much in control of that process so they are choosing what energies they allow in they are choosing what energies they are allowing to flow out uh, so can a magical person um, yeah be in relationship yes can they exchange energies yes uh, but it is very much a matter of will, a matter of choice, rather than a matter of humility or surrender, uh, which it would be to a mystical person. So love is different for uh, a magically inclined person. Um, but yeah, they are definitely capable of it. And also that their energy body is stable, that doesn't mean that a magician can't destabilize it when they want to or be receptive or reactive if they don't want to. But it is very much linked to their willpower. Uh, while the opposite is true of uh, a mystical person. A mystical person, in a way, um, is more connected to another person's willpower, another per the impulses which are around them. And uh, the magical person is therefore also limited in their experiences, because they can only um, often allow things um, yeah, up to their level of comfort, which is generally they have a low tolerance for things which are not generated by themselves. Uh, if you have a mystical person, they can often be transported or influenced very strongly, so their, um, ex yeah, their experience of relationship, uh, both on a human level and on a spiritual level, tends to be much more um, transformative, they get more out of relationships, they get more out of love, uh, you could say. Um, if you're looking for the more um, hierophantical and uh, capitalistical people, um, they tend not to experience love so much as an individual, but as part of a unity. Um, the Kabbalistical person, in a way, knows their role, knows the, the, their, yeah, the other person's role, and they uh, experience that. Uh, but there is always this knowledge, this mindset, this mental filter, which is coloring their experiences. Uh, but they are learning more about relationships, which is what, how the Kabbalistical mindset works. Uh, for the Hierophantical mindset, it is more about um, being in as perfect a relationship as possible, regardless of who you are within that relationship. So it, it tends to be much more selfless than uh, for other people. Um, so the last part of the question is, can a person be an addict and self-sufficient at the same time? Um, well, I think that if an addict is not using anything, they are in a way temporarily self-sufficient. Um, but I think that the essence of an addict is that they are 
placing a lot of power over their own lives outside of themselves. And an addict can be addicted to like a physical substance, like uh, indeed alcohol or cocaine or uh, whatever. But uh, people can also have sex addictions, gambling addictions, uh, um, all kinds of addictions, uh, gaming addiction, um, sometimes even a dominance or a, a, a subservient position addiction. Like you need a master, you need a boss to tell you what to do. And only then will you feel okay. <laughs> and um, ultimately the, the problem with addiction um, is that it is generally driven by the ego. Um, because the ego has certain desires um, and certain states it finds preferable to any other states. So it is trying to run away from certain parts and run towards other parts. And unless you have equanimity, if you can accept yourself as being an angry person, a sad person, a person who's happy, a person who's in pain, and can love and accept all those different sides of yourself, then there is a danger of addiction. So I do feel that spiritual development is a good counter for addiction. Um, so I don't... Can a person be self-sufficient? Yes, but... I don't think a person can be spiritually healthy and an addict. Okay, um, I would like to pause for a moment for questions because I've been talking for a while. Um, I'm hearing something, but I can't make it out. Uh, could you otherwise perhaps type it? Natalia, I can hear you speaking, but I cannot make out anything you're saying. Perhaps you could write it. already post the next question. Uh. Oh, well, my pleasure. Ah, <laughs> yes, Happy New Year to you too. <laughs> okay, I'll um, move into the next question. Um, does not being part of an egregore also implicate or require uh, a need for addiction? Um, 
in a way you could say that many people are more uh, in a way instead of being addicted to a substance they can also be addicted to a master, a guru or an egregore. Because it is also um, a method to, uh, to compensate for things which you cannot do yourself. Um, so I, I definitely wouldn't say that uh, a person who is not part of an egregore has, a, has more or less need of an addiction. Um, but I do feel that being part of an egregore um, can help. And depending on the egregore, it can also uh, mean that you lose your position within the egregore if you become an addict. Um, it's also a little bit necessary to distinguish between types of egregores. Because you have, of course, the light egregores, but you also have dark egregores and you also have non-spiritual egregores. Uh, so the non-spiritual egregores are, for instance, the egregores of a city, of a country, of a political movement, uh, of even a multinational corporation. Um, so these big conglomerates of energy, of harmonized energy, they also have their own goals, their own purposes. And when they're strong enough and harmonized enough, they can yeah, uh, form a, uh, a group. But uh, and that group, in a way, creates a current for all its members. It is pulling all its members in a certain direction. So a nation may have a certain course to go, or a city, or a country, or a people. So we tend to be part of egregores anyway, but not always of spiritual egregores. Um, also, often because we live our lives according to certain principles, we are attuned uh, or in sync with certain egregores, even though we may not have an initiation. Because often initiation uh, happens spontaneously. Uh, it can happen in a dream or it can happen while you're just working or drawing or meditating. So there's not always a need for a master or a teacher to initiate you. Um, it, is, it can be beneficial to have an initiation um, because some parts of you which might be blocking a deeper contact with the egregore can be removed through a process of initiation. So the contact with the egregore tends to be more stable, more clear after initiation. Um, the light side egregores, they tend to be very um, selective. And they also tend to be non-intrusive. So they tend not to do much for you or with you um, until you ask them or invite them in. And also, uh, as far as your life is going, you can decide to follow the current of the egregore, but they don't drag you along uh, very strongly. So there's a lot of freedom in the light side egregores. But it also means that you have to take a lot of responsibility for your own life, for your own advancement. If you go more towards the darker side, you find that the energy of the egregore is more dominant. Um, so they are more into um, seeing their members as um, just parts of their big machine. You're just a little cog in a machine which is driving the egregore as a group forward towards its goal. And of course, uh, any group takes care of its members, but it is not as free. And for some people this is a lot better, because if you don't know what the hell you're doing, you are lazy, you cannot take responsibility for your own life, then sometimes it is better that you are being controlled than that you're not doing anything <laughs> and not making any progress in your spiritual life. So this is one of the advantages or why also many people look for dark side egregores because there's less responsibility required, there's less effort required. But in exchange you have to give up a lot of control over your life, a lot of freedom, which you have to surrender to yeah, be part of such an egregore. Um, 
the more, uh, like we could say, um, non-spiritual egregores, they are often um, quite strong because they're very much connected to your social environment, so it is hard to escape their influence. So in that they resemble the dark side of the egregores, where they're really, like, in a way, programming you or pulling you in a certain way or a certain direction, which may not be the path which you choose or which your spirit chooses. Um, also, the thing is that um, on the dark side egregores, at least they have a, a set goal. They're not blind and they are trying to achieve something. And so there's a kind of a progress. You're being turned into a better tool for achieving that goal. If you have a non-spiritual egregore, often the goal is very uh, temporary. So, I don't know, for instance, Russia, Russia might be fighting with Britain and a hundred years later it is fighting with the US and another hundred years later it might be fighting with China. Um, so, in a way, the goals and the purposes change and therefore also the energy bodies and the needs and the influence it will have on you will change. Um, but all these changes in themselves they're not progress, they're just changes. Uh, so these non-spiritual egregores, they tend to consume a lot of your energy and they create changes which are so yeah, desirable socially, but they're an utter waste of your time and effort spiritually. Um, but often the, the connection to an egregore itself, um, especially if you're not taking like responsibility for your own life, it is nice to be part of something bigger. And to be part of something bigger can also be already progress, that you're learning humility, you're learning not to be self-centered, you're already liberating yourself from like certain ego constraints. And in, if you're on that level of advancement, then even being part of a non-spiritual egregore can help you because you can start to identify with something bigger, a bigger brotherhood. Um, and this is often also why people join the army or the police or uh, sometimes some big multinational to become part of a larger group because people are unable to guide themselves or to have built up a strong personality for themselves. Um, so they need to be shaped by other forces around them. And this is where egregores can be useful, especially the lower ones. So you could say that um, it is kind of an addiction in that it is a dependency on an outside force for people to feel good. So I do feel that many people yeah, can have a dark egregore or non-spiritual egregore addiction. Um, and I think ultimately if you have to choose between an addiction to a dark egregore or a non-spiritual egregore or another addiction, uh, that being addicted to an egregore might be better than being addicted to a drug or to a certain kind of behavior. Um, because a drug addiction or a behavioral addiction, there is ultimately no progress whatsoever. You're just in your own little circle and repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. While if you're part of an egregore, at least there's slightly bigger circles going on. Okay. So I'll pause again for questions while I look up the last, oh, last two questions which are still in the mail. Okay. Um, so the next question is, at the same time, the shamanic techniques involving use of plants of power or drugs if we use to, to contact the spirit world, does it involve an intentional making of a hole in one's energy body through which a magically stable person, a shaman, then establishes a channel to something beyond the borders of his own energy? Um, well. Uh, yeah, here you have actually 
um, two things. One of them is that uh, just like um, in, in Christianity there are celebrations like Christmas and Easter where people join together to make contact with uh, yeah, the Holy Spirit or with the, the essence of, of Christ. In the same way also within shamanic tradition you have uh, moments of ritual where people are contacting ancestors or uh, um, spirits or animal spirits or plant spirits. So these are usually certain cycles which just go on and usually every um, group like the ancestors is you know, celebrated once a year. And uh, for people who's, who don't have it as a job to work with ancestors, um, they also don't uh, build up that skill, they don't change their energy body to become a channel between like the spirit world and our world. Um, but they feel that they want to, uh, yeah, to be part of the ritual, to pay respect. And at these occasions they use a tool to make contact with spirits, ancestors and other things. And to pay their respect, to ask for any guidance for the rest of the year, to thank them for the blessings and the guidance they received in last year. So it is very much part of their religious ceremonies. And then you have the people who do it more or less professionally. Uh, the shamans, if you will, or magically stable per people. Hmm. And um, they tend to use the, um, uh, the spirit, the energies of the plants or the animals uh, they consume as teachers. It is not just the drugs, it can be any food they consume, whether they eat corn or a pig or a piece of salmon. Uh, they're all teachers to them. Uh, they're all spirits who uh, can share of their power, of their skills, of their wisdom with the shaman. Um, so if the shaman is any good um, and has paid attention to the lessons, they don't really need to consume it. But um they often use it to um, enhance their connection at that time so it is a little bit like you go to school you get a lesson and you tend to forget about it and when you see your teacher again you suddenly remember like oh yeah this is the teacher who taught me this and this or we work together on that project and all these memories resurface so often by smelling the drug again or consuming it and often the shaman will only use a small quantity because it's more used as a kind of a, a reminder or a primer to bring back that state in which they received all their lessons or their teachings. And um, yeah, they used it primer to get them back into that state but also to uh, create a link to the same drug which is in all the other people. Because by consuming of the same thing, um, you are all part of the same plant or of the same meal. Sharing meals is also very important to create like kind of one energy in the family or preparing food for each other. And um, by, by also consuming it, they have more of a feel for what the energy is doing in all the other people. So through the plant they have a connection with everybody else who consumed the plant. It's like their internet you could say. And so consuming it helps them to modulate what the energy of the plant is doing in that other person. Um, so they consume the plants to have more control of the plant. Uh, but they don't use it in a way to uh, to travel. They can travel by themselves. They don't need the plant to do that, although the plant does stimulate the energy body. Usually most psychedelics are more stimulating drugs, which heighten the, the energy and the flexibility of the energy body. Um, at least ayahuasca and peyote are. I don't know about all the mushrooms and other things. Um, so this creates um, 
extra energy, but this extra energy also needs to be harnessed, needs to be controlled, because otherwise you can very easily get lost in the chaos between uh, the worlds and all the numerous dimensions. So you need a strong willpower, and this strong willpower can be either your own willpower as a traveler, or it can be the willpower of the shaman who's guiding the travelers, or the, the power of the animal spirit, or the um, spirit guide, or the ancestor who's helping you in your journey. And ideally it's of course a combination of all these things, which helps you to, uh, to travel in a, in a ritual. Uh, it's usually best done in a ritual because there you can contain all the energies and invite also the powers to help you to transform it. If you uh, use drugs in a non-ceremonial setting, uh, you will often experience things, have visions, uh, but you won't have the necessary power or life force to transform yourself. And um, if you do it in a ritual setting, you create a closed space so the energy doesn't flow away but builds up uh, over time and you also invite other powers to put in energy into the ritual so you invite spirits, gods, angels, saints, whatever to energize the place and by having all this energy available the uh, experiences you have can be much more transformative um, and of course, having a shaman there who knows your intentions, they can also help you with the transformation process by doing treatments on you and helping you to move the energy through blockages and to transform the blocking energies and release it and remove it from the uh, ritual space so that the energy retains its high quality. So having a good shaman in a ritual is, is essential and having a properly cleansed and closed ritual space is also very important. Um, so the, um, the thing is also that uh, the, the energy can be invited by the shaman, um, but if other people are also uh, going into a trance, uh, and this can be with or without drugs, they can also bring in energies. Um, so one of the rituals I did in Latvia a few years ago um, was actually also by inviting the members of the group to carry an energy into a ritual space by making their own connections and uh, if you only use the shaman, the shaman has a limited view of the cosmos. Um, but everybody else also has a view of the cosmos and they have contact to other powers. So if everybody's involved in the ritual, uh, then a lot more power and a lot more harmony uh, can exist in the ritual space. But it needs to be conducted well. And often you see that a group who conducts rituals together, they become more attuned to each other, more harmonized with each other. So uh, a group who does rituals on a regular basis, like once a week, uh, together they build up way more energy than a group of strangers you put together in a ritual space. Okay, uh, that brings us to the last question. Do only magically stable people reach the upper or superior worlds, or is the magical stability not crucial in regard to what happens to the person after death? Well, that's a tricky one. Mm. Because um, magical capability it tends to be a bit of a two-edged sword. Um, it definitely helps you uh, in many aspects, especially in dealing with all the distractions in this world. So a magical, capable person, they won't be distracted by pain, by hunger, by fear, by their thoughts, or uh, by noise, uh, whether it's cold, what surroundings they're in. 
uh, also what energetic surroundings they're in because they can just deal with all these energies they don't allow them to upset their energy bodies so in our low vibration world being magically capable is very helpful um, if you're going up it can also be a limit because you travel by in a way transforming your own energies but you can only transform your own energies as far as your own consciousness is, is capable of conceiving. So you're trapped within your own limitations. Um, so it helps you to, uh, to move more often, more easily, more quickly into higher worlds. But also the high, how high you can go tends to be limited by your own consciousness. Which unfortunately being a human is very limited we are not very high conscious highly conscious beings uh, on this bigger scale of things um, what is very important is that uh, if you're talking about death that a magically stable person can choose their own incarnations uh, in general when a person dies they become very trapped in the chaos um, they become influenced by all kinds of powers, by the form they used to be in, by their own humanity, by their family, by the country they lived in, by the egregores they're bound to. Um, so people tend to be pulled into inc other incarnations without a lot of conscious choice, without a lot of consideration. They just float on the current of energies which they formed in their previous lives and in a way their future lives are determined by their previous lives. For a magically aware and capable person this is not the case. They are aware of their attachments, they can control their attachments and therefore they can control what form they will take in their previous incarnation. Uh, so they're no longer trapped by their habits, they're no longer trapped by their past. And they can choose to incarnate as a human again or as a higher being or as a lower being but also depending on their desire and also depending on their consciousness because ultimately this is also their limit. The other limit is an external limit which is imposed on beings on this in this solar system which is karma. And of course there has to be the opportunity uh, in the time frame because not everything can happen within a certain place and time. So you might have to wait until the right opportunity arises for the incarnation you desire. So a medically capable person is definitely much more in control on what happens after death. Um, this also brings up the relationship between enlightenment and magical capability. Um, enlightenment requires freedom to be free of all illusions, of all attachments. And um, there is um, a magical way uh, uh, to do that. And actually, most methods uh, uh, of, uh, within Buddhism, they are uh, mainly magical. So they're mainly about uh, practicing uh, meditation uh, practicing transformation, practicing control of the energy body. And by doing this, by acquainting yourself with yourself, with your own energy, with your own nature, you get control over it and ultimately you learn to control it. And this is magical progress. There is one other side to it and this is basically the mystical side of it. And this is to say like you have a responsibility and only you can control yourself this is also your task and if you cannot control it then also grammatically you shouldn't be able to choose your own inclinations but you can accept teachers which is the mystical side of things and there you of course get into the distinction between the karmatic gods and the non-karmatic gods so is ultimately your teacher helping you to liberate yourself or is your teacher just helping you to be better at something and for instance if you look at like your the ordinary uh, teachers we have in school 
they're teaching you to be better at math or at economics or at biology or at something else, which is um, very purpose oriented. Um, and also many uh, spiritual teachers who are t will teach you about healing or meditation or something else. They just make you better at something. And that something can be a useful tool, but you have to distinguish that it is a tool, it is not a purpose. Um, and you have teachers like uh, Vladimir Stepanov, who is a real master, and they're not just giving you tools. They're actually uh, teaching your spirit. They are helping your spirit to evolve into a higher state. And yeah, that's something else entirely. <laughs> um, so the teaching is not so much uh, a teaching of the consciousness, which is in control, but they're actually helping your subconscious self, your spirit, to, to grow as well. And uh, this is more the non-karmatic teaching. Um, so depending on the, the, the egregores, so most egregores also teach you certain skills, so they're very similar to like the earthly teachers, they teach you a certain path of development. But often once you get higher within an egregore and you start making contact with the angels or the deities or the masters uh, or enlightened beings which are part of an egregore or alien cultures which are part of an egregore, uh, then also they are start teaching your spirit itself and helping your spirit itself to transform, to grow instead of just giving the consciousness more tools. But these are usually the really the higher levels of teachings, the more the uh, TRG side of things rather than the Tomati uh, uh, side of things. So the higher magic rather than the lower magic. And often when people speak about magic, they talk about lower magic, controlling everything in the world of form. Um, which has to do, of course, with where our consciousness is at now. But the real, yeah, uh, higher powers, the gods, the angels, the, the masters, and they're more interested in, in the, the formless magic, in working with the essence of things and understanding the essence of things and um, teaching your spirit how to relate to the essence of things, which will, of course, relate to many different manifestations of working with all kinds of different powers, but it's much more fundamental. But on this um, level of, of working on the, on the theurgy side of things, uh, you have to realize that um, although your willpower still exists, your personality can no longer exist to work on that level. You cannot be human and work on that level. You really have to be completely aware and transformed into the consciousness of your spirit um, to work like that. And once you have already reached that stage, it's only then that you can really wisely uh, decide what form is best for you. So even though you can work on your magical in, uh, evolution and that I can get control over your incarnations, uh, if your spirit is not evolved in or enough or if your consciousness hasn't evolved into becoming aware of your spirit to guide you into what incarnation you will take, you can ultimately trap yourself into taking very pleasurable, very nice, very powerful incarnations, which ultimately won't help your evolution. So magical power, while it is still in the Tomaturgical state can be very much a, a trap or an addiction in itself. Okay, my throat is getting a little bit hoarse from talking, so I'll just see if there's any more questions or comments. see some typings coming up. Yeah, 
Yes, I. We have to thank Sandra for the wonderful questions. Yeah. Uh. Okay. Well, I'll uh, uh, post this recording and send it around. And yeah, I'll upload it. Uh, and I'll see you again then uh, next month, first Thursday of the month. Okay, thank you all very much for listening. Bye bye.